Welcome to Below the Surface. Uh, this is a very special virtual remembrance uh, and fundraiser for the family of Lermont Stowers Jones. Yeah. My name is Jessica Luther Rummel. And I'm Katina Stone Butler. And thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of this very special night. So um, before we get uh, too far ahead of ourselves, uh, let's take a minute to just talk about what we're gonna do tonight and what we're here to do. So first and foremost, we're gonna talk about Lermont Stowers Jones, yes. uh, his role and his life here in the Denton community. Yes, and we're going to have first ever public interviews with Mont's family. We're gonna expose some of the disturbing details surrounding Mont's mysterious death and the events that took place in weeks leading up to recovery of Mont's body. We're gonna expose the egregious failures of Denton County and state officials in charge of the investigation and highlight the family's ongoing fight for truth and justice. We're gonna have special musical performances. Really excited about that. Yeah. Um, really good friend of mine, Jess Garland, will be performing for us. Uh, Jess is a Dallas-based recording artist. Uh, she is a multi-instrumentalist, most known for her uh, ethereal jazz performances that blend uh, harp and guitar, yeah, which I love. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Archetype, another Dallas-based artist. Um, really cool, blends uh, lots of old blues and jazz influences with modern uh, beats and rap. Uh, and he's got a really clear um, and I would say poignant social political message that I vibe with. I know he's, you do too. Yeah, he's like a modern day, like Gil Scott Heron. That's yeah, what I think of. For sure. Yeah. And of course, you. Yeah. KB Uncomplicated, let's talk about you. Yeah, I have an amazing uh, collective of artists. Most, uh, most of us are UNT School of Music graduates or an alumni. Um, I, they're a great band of musicians and singers who, are, who live in Denton um, and have a heart for Lamont's story. So it's been amazing just even that journey of bringing everyone together. But I'm really excited about all of the artistry that's going to be, um, you know, that, that, that's gonna be showed today. Everyone put their heart and soul into it. And we have artists from Dallas and Fort, all throughout DFW and even visual art yeah. that we're gonna have displayed. But of course, let's not forget too, uh, we have a very special performance coming from uh, some of Lermont's yes. music teachers, right? Yes. Yeah, so a very special performance there. And we're gonna get more into that uh, here in a little bit for you. Um, but we also wanna make sure that we talk about Lermont again and his role. And before we get too far in, I wanna make sure that I do some housekeeping. If you're tuned in with us right now, I wanna encourage you to make sure that you're using two devices. So make sure that whatever device you're using to watch the stream, whether it be directly uh, on YouTube or Facebook, make sure that you're engaging in those chats on one device, but use your second device, whether that be your laptop or your cell phone, to go to justicevermont.com. And there on our website, uh, you can find a number of ways that you can support Lermont Stowers Jones's family and their fight for justice, mm -hmm. uh, which is our goal tonight, right? Tonight right. is a fundraiser. Yes, We're gonna raise $10,000 tonight. Yes, and to do the job that law enforcement didn't. That's right, and we're yeah. gonna go into that more here in a little while, but I wanna encourage you to make sure that you do go to the website and click on those links. You can make a donation, you can buy a t-shirt, yeah. like we're wearing here tonight. Yes. Um, and you can also bid on some artwork, and we're going to talk some more about that art, too. Um, but again, tonight, what we want to start out with is just a celebration of Mont and his story. Yeah, because right? so many times when tragedies like this happen, we limit the person, the victim. Um, a lot of times we put them on trial. Uh, African-American boys and girls get put on trial, and their lives get picked apart. But Lamont was a human being. He was a person. He had dreams, plans, goals, ambitions. His family poured into him. They invested in him. He had siblings who love him. They have a rhythm and a flow of life, things that they did on a routine basis. They, he has a backstory that's worth telling. Yeah, he's more than just his tragic end. Right, no and doubt. He's more than a hashtag or a soundbite or some news headline that's, take, like, that's taken out of context. Oh, you wouldn't be talking about that horrible uh, news headline written by the Denton Record Chronicle, I would wouldn't. you? I would Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Denton Record Chronicle, that was, that was really raggedy. Poorly done. And disrespectful yeah. to a family that lives right here in this community. So since we on air, we don't, that was raggedy. 
So um, I know also, too, your family had a personal connection with Lamont uh, as a student at Denton High School, right? He was on the AB Honor Roll. He and connected with a lot of the programs and students there. Yeah, he's a really smart kid. I know many of his teachers. We've been here in Denton for... I came for school at UNT 25 years ago, so a lot of my, co my college classmates are teachers in the area, and everyone has such great things, has had such great things to say about him. My oldest son, um, who is now 22, graduated from Denton High School in 2016. Right. As he was graduating, Lamont was a freshman, and so I'm sure they crossed paths. Yeah. Um, but I also, my husband knows um, Lermont's father, and he had been to our house because um, he does, he has a business where he does like AV, um, uh, what is it? AC uh, and AC, AC, yeah. yeah. And so we'd had him, we see, and we've seen each other in the community at church. I've sang at uh, the church where the ministers who uh, tutored and uh, raised Lermont up in music, I, where they sing and where they play and where they lead worship. So it's just interesting how we've, you know, been connected. But um, this young man, he was, he was a student at Denton High School. Like, this Denton High School is the first high school in Denton. Right. And it's just amazing to me how the community at large has just been neglectful to uplift this story. We right. should be, we should be, we should be just grieved right. that justice hasn't, he hasn't received the justice that he's due. Well, we're going to start by changing that tonight. That's yeah. for sure. That's what Absolutely. tonight is all about. Uh, tonight we are here to talk about Mont, this caring, compassionate student and member of our community. And I don't think anybody could tell that story better than Mont's family themselves. Right. And tonight, for the yes. first time, we're going to hear from Mont's family directly. And um, just real quick, before we go to hear from Mont's family, I want to remind everyone that when you go to justicevermont.com and you make a contribution on our website to the investigation fund, uh, so that we can continue our independent investigation into the, the events surrounding Mont's death. You can leave uh, a direct message of support and encouragement yeah. for Mont's family, who is joining us here live in the yeah. theater tonight, and we're going to share some of those with them. So um, I think now's a good time. Let's take a moment to hear from Mont's family. Yeah. Didn't high school was a good school for the most part. Yeah, it's really good academically, and the teachers made sure that the students felt welcome. We not hung out with like all like the the good kids, I guess. Like they all went to classes, they all did what they had to do, they all kept their grades up, and they all like kept up a good persona in the school. He hung out with mostly like the people who were on the football team and basketball teams and whatnot because like you would go to practice together. Well, he was like the celebrity of Denha. He'd walk in and everybody. Everybody just had to greet him. Everybody had to give him a handshake or something like that. A lot of the girls liked him. I think it was because of how funny he was. You would know whenever he's coming down the hallway because you would just hear laughing. And, and you could recognize his laugh from a mile away. He was just excited about his future as well as ours. He was just an outstanding student. Um, there was even times where I actually didn't think he was doing homework. And he was actually doing pretty, doing his homework and studying. And um, I know he applied to several colleges and actually was accepted. Um, after his past night, I actually got the phone calls from the colleges as in, uh, why Lamont is not there yet. Yeah, wow. So yeah. when Mont passed in November of 2018, he was set to graduate that yeah. following spring. And I was so impressed to learn uh, that his academics and his reputation were so notable yeah. at Denton High School that they graduated him after he deceased. Absolutely. I mean, that's a statement in and of itself. In and of itself. Yeah. And the fact that he was getting college acceptance letters and expected to be going to college, his family expected him to be going to college, and then that was cut short. And to continue to receive letters um, where there's this, there was a hope in that, that yeah. was cut short. Yeah. 
I, and I know that in, in speaking with the family, um, a big part of their uh, getting through that and, and supporting one another came from church. Absolutely. And church played a big role uh, in Mont's family and in, in Mont's life, um, but also among his siblings and, and continuing to nurture a passion for music. Yes, and so the African-American church uh, was birthed from enslavement and bondage. And you, you have a people that uh, were enslaved who, who were not allowed to speak, um, were not allowed to read, and their only form of communication was to be able to sing while, while they worked. And that created this amazing tradition that, that's manifested um, in gospel music, the gospel music that we know now, uh, know now was birthed from that experience. And gospel music is a powerful, a powerful um, source and tool. And it's the way we've encouraged each other. Mm -hmm. It's the way, even with spiritual songs where they plotted and planned escape mm -hmm. um, and, and embedded it into the lyrics of songs, they serve many purposes. So it just makes sense even now with the legacy and the heritage of that music, with that style of music, that it still uplifts, it still encourages, and it's in our DNA. It makes sense, like Lermont, he comes from a long line of musicians. His father was a musician, um, and his father's father was a musician, and family, his aunts, uncles. So it just makes sense, like that's in, that, that was in his blood, and he, uh, played for the church youth music group. And, you know, just the videos of him playing on the keyboard and the smiles that he had on his face. He enjoyed that. He loved that. Um, the whole family. I know yeah. that at one point the whole family was playing together. All the kids, yeah. uh, Mont and his siblings, really shared that passion for, for music, music together. Yeah. And I know that that really helped uh, the, the family, even after Mont's passing, and Absolutely. just healing. Um, and even with the church, I mean, gospel music and the church, the African-American church has just this long line, this history of just undergirding our fight for freedom and civil rights and human rights. And we relate heavily to the story of Exodus. And so enslaved black people, that's how they got through. You know, they would sneak off to read and they would sneak off to uplift each other with these stories. And that's what we still continue to do in the black church today because a lot of times where the world won't listen to us, we can find validation and comfort and strength and encouragement in the way we praise, the way we shout, the way we sing. Um, so it makes sense that even since Lermont has passed on, that his family would draw strength from um, that, that form. Well, I had an opportunity to speak with Mont's siblings directly about um, their experience uh, with music in the church, and yeah. especially with their brother. And yeah. I think nobody can tell that story better than them. So right. why don't we take a minute to hear from Mont's siblings? Yeah. Church was a big part of our family, um, especially um, Lerman's background, because his dad's a pastor. His, uh, most of his family members are pastors and they are big in the church. Lamont and Lamont were interested in playing the instruments in the church. So we actually joined the church and then got the kids involved in the things that they had in, in church. I think Lamont and Lamont was eight and nine when they started playing. Lamont played the keyboard and Lamont played the bass. And then the girls participated in the choir. So I actually gave Lamont the keyboard in Lamont, the bass, and when I came back in the room, <laughs> they switched and said, no, I'm gonna play the bass and I'm gonna play the keyboard. And it worked out pretty good. Uh, both of them very talented on their instruments. And um, they caught on pretty quick. We actually have videos of them first starting out playing. Cause he went out and bought, we had a whole music room set up in our house. We had drums, keyboard, bass. We had all this stuff set up in our house. Me and my brother, we always play music together. Like. Every chance we got, we would just go inside of our little music room yet, and we would just practice. And then, so it's like we were always there and we had our free time. So, other than playing sports, that's the, you know, that's the other thing we did was just go play music. And we really liked doing it, we really liked playing together. Smart was a very talented musician. 
Mott wrote plenty of songs and then tried to teach the rest of us it, and we really caught on to most of it. Yeah, he loved to make up songs. Oh, yeah. He played, he made up a lot of songs. Wow. That's really touching to hear how even after um, Mont's passing, you know, and talking to the kids, they continued that tradition. They continue to play music yeah. uh, with one another. And I personally have sat and watched so many home videos yeah. of those kids playing together. Um, Beautiful. And it's, it's, it is, it's really touching, but it also just speaks to the level of um, the whole yes. that has been left in this family's life. And the love that they have for each other, that was genuine, that right. was real. They were a loving and caring family. Um, and they enjoyed doing life together. Yeah, I think as we all do with our families. And yeah. that's really what we want to emphasize tonight. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about uh, this concept of remembering that uh, Mont's death is not uh, the summary of Mont's experience. Exactly. Mont was a member of our community. Mont was um, a son, a, a brother. A, yeah. You know, a cousin, a grandson, a nephew, a musician, a friend, a musician, a church member, yeah, um, a great student. Right. And so I, this brings us to our first musical performance this evening. Yeah, very excited um, about featuring, it. Featuring some traditional gospel ensemble uh, music performed by Cyrus Hafford and Lester Newsom. And they are uh, a part of Lermont's mentorship mm -hmm. in the church. And so we're really excited. They're close friends of the Jones family. They're Mont's me music mentors. Cyrus will actually be playing on Mont's keyboards. Yeah. And together he and Lester will be performing three of Mont's favorite songs. Yeah, let's, hit, let's do it. Search. 
search my heart. My heart. Yeah. Yeah. You know. You know. You know. You know. When I'm wrong. When I'm wrong. Oh, yes, you do, Lord. Yeah. And you know. You know. You know. You know. When I'm wrong. Yeah. If you find. And strengthen me. I want you to take it out. Take it out. And strengthen. And strengthen me. It was awesome. It was really awesome. Yeah. I think the most unfortunate part about it is everyone didn't get to hear us singing background vocals right? in the, over here on the sidelines, yes, right? Yes, it was awesome. Um, <laughs> it, it, I've never heard any of those songs before. I was just mentioning to you until, you know, we started rehearsing for this uh, event and now I know them all by heart. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I grew up singing them, so yeah, but, they are really beautiful songs. Um, I, the first song. Um, yeah. Search My Heart, that's my favorite. And turns out, in talking with Mont's father, Lerman, that was also Lermont's favorite song. And I can relate, you know, it's a really powerful message. We all, you know, carry around that grief and sorrow. And, yeah. you know. And, and it's a popular song uh, that has been done uh, via different arrangements throughout the years. There are so many different arrangements of the song. And it's, it's from Psalm 139, 23, and 24 that says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So it's a song about transparency. It's a song about accountability, like wanting to mature and grow in the Lord, that the Lord would search your heart uh, for, for things that are not honoring him and to, to, to make us right before the Lord. So it's just really a powerful testament to who Lamont is that that song uh, resonated, especially with him being so young. A lot of times the younger generation doesn't really uh, feel those old gospel tunes and that Lamont, he really, you know, that that resonated to him, resonated with him. It's just another testimony of who he was yeah. and what, what God was doing in his life and where he wanted to, you know, he didn't get the opportunity to grow uh, and mature and, and us see, you know, the fruit of those years. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's really powerful. And it must be powerful, right? I mean, even for persons like myself who, who are not members of the Christian faith, right. um, to be able to be touched by those lyrics Absolutely. and understand the concept of, of Absolutely. Um, you know, opening your heart out to process grief and sorrow um, and, and maturing in that. Like you said, I, I like that you related that to transparency and yeah. accountability. I mean, Absolutely. that's obviously relevant to our conversation tonight. Um, but most importantly, you know, the, the fact that, that music and art are ways that uh, we can all relate to healing. Yeah. Um, and, and if you go right now, to justicevermont.com. Yeah. Uh, you can click on the link for our online virtual art auction, uh, which has been made possible by dozens of, of Denton, local Denton creatives, which we're very grateful for. Yeah. Um, 
all the, the monies uh, that are made from that online art auction will go towards the funding of an independent investigation into Lermont's death and continuing the family's search for truth and justice and transparency. Um, and we have a few of the, the pieces that have been contributed here with us tonight that yeah. we wanted to feature on stage here. Um, there at the center is one of my personal favorites. This piece uh, was de uh, dedicated and donated by uh, a local Denton artist named Dustin Choice, who goes by Scoobs, mm -hmm. and that work is entitled Sons of Jacob, and it's from his 2017 Righteous Collection. Yeah. Um, one of my personal favorites, as I said, I've, I've been holding on to that piece for a while. It was one of the earliest pieces um, donated, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, you guys might have to fight me for it. I might actually be <laughs> online here in, in between some segments. Somebody might have to outbid me. Uh, but another piece also I want to point to is the acrylic piece painted and contributed by Hannah Davis, another uh, Denton artist, and that piece is entitled Soul Recognition. Mm. And in her artist statement, I found it really interesting how Hannah highlights um, some of the same points we've been talking about tonight, and that's how art facilitates uh, a transference of her internal struggles yeah. into an outward expression of healing. And, and so I thought that it was important to highlight that piece with us here yes. tonight. And then also I want to point to another piece a lo uh, donated by a local ceramics artist and teacher, Miriam Mitchell, who created this beautiful, large uh, terracotta vessel uh, to contribute to the Jones family's uh, fight for truth and justice. And you can find all of these works on our website, justicevermont.com, um, and, and you can bid on those artworks. And, and all of that will help us get to our goal which is $10,000. That is our goal tonight. We're yes. going to raise $10,000. And I'm really happy to report that so far, uh, just in the short time that we've started our program tonight, uh, we have raised uh, $1,100 uh, right out the door. So thank oh, you so much to everyone you. who's already donating and contributing and helping us get to our goal. Um, yeah. There's definitely something for everyone on the online Absolutely. auction. You had a great idea earlier. You were talking about people doing some really early holiday shopping. There we go. There you go. <laughs> Or, you know, maybe just send the link to a friend. Um, but definitely be sure to check that out before the night's over because that's what we're here to do is support this family. Yeah, and this kind of com commitment to community, to, to togetherness that gets us through times of struggle because it takes all of us. I just want to thank the creative community of Denton uh, for coming together to support this family and to lend your gifts, um, talents, time, treasure, abilities, even the film crew and, you know, the editing and audio and just everything that's been writing, um, humanizing Lamont in his story. It's just been overwhelming to see and I know that it's an encouragement to the family. And this is what it's about. When, when, a, when a child is lost, it's so funny how we will um, criminalize a young black boy who, he was a child. He was a child, he was still in high school, whereas white children who are even older sometimes will still uh, be bestowed, you know, that youthful innocence. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that he was a child, the community should be rallying around this family. There should be an outpour. And so we're just grateful that as the story of Lamont is getting out by this grassroots movement, by people like you, mm -hmm. um, sister, who have, pushed his story forward, that now the family is seeing that there is community in Denton that cares about this baby. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things um, we talk about is, you know, Mont was a child with ambitions, with dreams yeah. and hopes. And one of those hopes uh, was to be a law enforcement officer. Yeah, ironically. Yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate that um, some of the individuals who he and his family were counting on the most uh, after his passing to ensure justice and transparency, unfortunately failed the family. But regardless, Mont did hope to be an officer. And I think now's a good time maybe to, to hear from Mont's family a little bit. We did yeah. have a chance to talk to them about that. So why don't we take a moment to hear from Mont's family about his Absolutely. dreams. Yeah, Lamont wanted to be a, a police officer. He wanted to be a law enforcement he, on the day of Lamont's funeral. When we walked into the church, I was so surprised to see a bench full of police officers that uh, admired Lamont and Lamont both. 
on what they uh, did and accomplished in their program. And there was three benches, I believe, that was filled up with the um, Den Police Youth Academy. Um, so, you know, he wanted to be a police officer, so he definitely put an impact uh, in that program. Uh, to have all the officers there and like and like I said, all the kids from the class was also there. Uh, three benches full of just kids. He did want to be a police officer. We had plans on being partners actually, but yeah. He had his heart set on being a police officer because when he was doing a class at the ATC, he'd come home and show us and teach us stuff like the Miranda rights, the Miranda rights to show us like what it was and how to say it correctly. I think you admired the respect that they got. Like when you see one, it's just like, oh look, hey, it's a police officer. And I feel like he wanted that respect too. Wow, yeah. that, wow. To hear that from his siblings and his parents, that he wanted to be a law enforcement official and that he knew what Miranda rights were and those pictures of him in police uniform. What it takes for a young African-American boy, the hurdles that you have to jump over um, with brutality and just the images and the things that we see and the things that we experience, for him to de desire to, be, to do something so noble, um, it's really, it's amazing, but then it's also extremely sad that this is the way, um, that, by the way, it's, it, it's extremely sad the way that he has not received justice. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's astounding to hear about how much uh, respect that Mont had uh, for law enforcement, how much of his um, early childhood was framed by a desire to want to serve his community and yet uh, in his family's time of need when his family was most in need yeah. of the support of law enforcement and when he, in his final uh, passing, was in need of justice yeah. and counting on local law enforcement to just not, not do anything special, right? to just do their job. Right. Um, he was failed, and we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to lay out some of those details for you all tonight. But um, again, before we got into that, we thought it was really important to just highlight Mont and, and his journey before that. Um, because again, uh, Mont's life was more than his tragedy. He was a friend. He was a family member. Um, we just hear over and over again, every time we talk to Mont's family, every time we talk to his friends, yeah. we just hear about this generous, kind spirit. Um, how close Mont was to his family and his siblings. I mean, they did everything together. Yeah. Right? I mean, and here in just a minute, we're definitely going to talk more about those direct relationships. Um, but again, I mean, we want to remind people what we're here to do. Absolutely. And that's where we need you to go to the website, justiceformont.com. Um, send encouraging messages to the family. Let them know that you see them and you hear them. Um, and make a donation. We're trying to hold law enforcement in Denton County and uh, uh, accountable for the ways that they failed this family. And it's two years later and they still have not received justice. So we really need for everyone to contribute to their cause. Um, I know uh, Denton, Denton Record Chronicle, they started the article off with uh, family tries to raise funds. And let me tell you something. This family doesn't need m money to go on a, a trip. They're basically needing financial su support so that they can get justice for their son and do the work and require the work um, and get the, the support that the Ditton County law and fish, uh, officials didn't, that they didn't do. The family is not seeking funds. The family is seeking answers, right. and that takes money, um, right. especially when the institutions put in place in our community that are designed to get those answers for us. We all think that when something bad happens, when there's a tragic death or an end like that, that we can just automatically count on law enforcement to give us those answers that justice is just the next part of the equation. But unfortunately, as we have seen... That's not the case that for it's not, it's not the case, and no. it's unfortunately uh, all too often not the case when it comes to 
black and brown bodies. And right. we see that over and over again. Um, we are getting closer to our goal. Come I do on. wanna take a moment to talk about yes. that. So if you haven't yet, justicevermont.com, you can bid on artwork, you can buy a t-shirt, which not only, I really wanna encourage people, you know, a t-shirt is a great option because it not only contributes to the investigative fund, but it also allows you to help spread Mont's story yes. and, and get the word out. Say his so, name. That's right. Uplift his story, yes. But right now, um, as of 6.50, Come on. we are at uh, $1,345 of our goal. Awesome. And I wanna um, read some messages here here, uh, Crystal Lusk from Oregon is sending her wow. love and support. So all the way from Oregon, Thank you, Crystal. people are reaching out from across the nation to wow. send their love and support and contributions to help uh, the Lamont Stowers Jones family. And yeah. I want to just say right now to my, my friends and my family here in Denton, uh, if Oregon can rally together around this family, certainly we can too. On, so Denton. be sure to take the time to share this uh, event that's going on right now with your local friend, with your friends and your family. You can send it direct text message, uh, post it on your social media platforms with the hashtag social justice, or excuse me, Justice Vermont. Again, that's hashtag Justice Vermont. Um, and right now we are at $1,345 of our $10,000 goal. Uh, also, Rachel Weaver, a uh, Denton resident, has just donated $50 uh, to the fund. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. We appreciate you coming through. Um, so before uh, we get too much in, because you know I could talk forever, and you know if you, don't, if you don't stop us, we will. Yeah. Um, I want to tell everybody to keep up the good work, uh, but let's get back to honoring Mont yes. as a brother and a son and a member of our Denton community. Yes. Uh, nobody can do that better than Mont's family. Yes. I enjoy playing sports with him. He was always a good teammate. He would always want to teach us how to get better. You know, play basketball. I played basketball for a long time, and he's one of the person, like, he's someone that made me better. Since he played the piano and I played the flute, if I needed help with something, he'd look at the music and figure it out and then teach me how to play it. And then sometimes we just figure out a song together just to play it just for the fun of it. We always rode our bikes to go play basketball, play football, so we were, like, always together. We were planning on having our own team to play against other families. And it was just gonna be like the Jones family basketball team. He was just over the top with everything. Just overly excited. He wanted to do everything. Um, he liked being around family. It's whenever it would be someone's birthday or we just turn on the music in the front room and we'll just be dancing. He'll be the craziest dancer you've ever seen. And you couldn't stop him either. Whenever it was time to lay down, he didn't want to lay down. He would want to dance for a couple more hours. And he just brought joy to everybody. He, he, he liked to learn, and he would actually watch things that I uh, would do when I was working on the cars or uh, working on the air conditioning system. He wanted to know how it worked. But he was a friend to me uh, as well as his son. Uh, because he would actually sometimes put me in my place, even though I didn't want to listen because he was my child, <laughs> you know, but he would actually say certain things that make me, hey, sit down and think. Um, my relationship with him was very, very good. Um, almost everything that uh, Lamont has good done um, whenever he walked out the house, regardless if he was upset or if we, if he got in trouble, he always said, I will see you later and I love you. Even if he didn't want to, he respected people. Even if he didn't agree with what they thought, they, he always answered with yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. And just upheld the most respect as he could. And he made sure everyone else felt respected as well. He was a really, really bright person. He'd walk in and the room would just get instantly brighter. He'd always make you laugh, make you feel like, make you feel happy even if you were upset or anything. Lamar was the type of person to always be there for someone. Whenever you needed a shoulder to lean on, he was there. You could always count on my brother. He was the type of brother that he would make you smile and you would just, whenever he was around, you were never in a bad mood. He would make you smile, he'll make you laugh. If the room was quiet, he'd just make a joke or make a weird noise to make you laugh. 
just to see you brighten up a little bit. We had a good time. We laughed and danced. And Thanksgiving, he'd be the one in there tasting. Both moms of teenage boys and I don't know, we've, we've been able to do some commiserating yes. on that. You know, there are a lot of experiences that you and I can share oh, yeah. as far as being a, a mother of teenage boys. But of course, um, at the same time, there's also uh, a real truth that we have to come to terms with. I do as a white mother and a mother of a white son. And that is simply that there are some experiences that uh, you and I don't share. Right. as a mother of teenage boys. Yeah. You know, I, I can rest assured that my son's never going to be uh, profiled in a store because of the color of his skin. Right. Uh, I know that if my son is invited to a sleepover by a friend, um, it's likely sincere and not so that he can be tormented, yeah. as we just learned happened to the young boy exactly. in Plano. And um, that's the thing. We don't realize how brutality it translates into community relationships. It, it transfers into school. Lamont was bullied. Yeah. Um, and there was no support there. The family reported it several times. They have a record of reporting and talking to teachers. And we don't realize how implicit bias, racism, um, and just racialized you call it clannish activity. I love it when you say clannishness. Clannishness. We don't realize how that transfers into the work environment, schools. Like, as a mother of three black boys, I've seen so. And my husband is a police officer. My husband is a police officer, has worked in law enforcement, and studied criminology, um, has a story, you know, a lot like Lermont's, wanted to be a police officer all his life. Um, and it's interesting. Want, wanting to, you know, uplift and up, up, uh, respect law enforcement. We have that in our household. Right. But then we've been pulled over by the police and asked why we were in our own neighborhood when our house was right in front of us. You know, my son, my oldest son has been pulled over and bullied by um, the Denton County Sheriff's Department. Yes, we know um, that it's happened. And detained for 40, and, and my, like, my children, I don't have anything to prove. I shouldn't have to prove that my kids obey the law and that they're upstanding. But just even skateboarding down the street, mm. he's been pulled over. Something that you see white kids doing didn't all the time. But him skateboarding down the street with his guitar on his back warrants him being pulled over by the cops. Right. And so just that criminalization in school, even one of my sons is just, all three of them are very smart, but one is gifted, talented program, and, and all people know to do, like when kids are, when you're a black boy specifically, you have to be really, really funny, the funny black guy that everybody can, you know, get a laugh from, or you have to be athletic, or you're, you know, criminalized. If you are even just a quiet kid who just is introverted, mind your business, you know, then it's you, you have an attitude. It's just this assumed criminality. And you don't think that that translates to these people who are racist, their grandparents were, you know, going to lynchings in the 60s and spitting on folks when they integrated schools and they taught their children. And you don't think that translates to the next generation and next generation when we don't deal with that stuff. And it permeates well beyond, you know, because Lermont was not killed by uh, law enforcement, but it was like he was killed again when he couldn't get the justice that his family and he deserved. So it, you might as well say it's all the same. For people who would say, oh, well, he wasn't killed by police brutality. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was, because it's the same spirit. It's the same demonic spirit. It's the same demonic forces where a family is being criminalized mm -hmm. and treated like trash when they just want to know what happened to their son. Any, anybody should be able to get that. Anybody who lost their child should be able to receive just the, like the respect, calling them on the phone instead of knocking on the door. Well, and in some cases, they didn't even get that. Exactly. And what I hear you talking about, Katina, is a level of invisibility. Yes. And I, and I as well, and I can relate to that. You know, I can make a, a post on social media, uh, a picture of my son doing yard work and right. it blows up. Oh, I can yeah. get a viral post. Oh yeah. 
but I make a post calling for people to pay attention to the story of this child and the suffering that the family has endured in the silence that followed and the failures of law enforcement, and I have to pay to get people to look at it. And then you have to get crap from that, folks. Right. So it's just a level of invisibility. It is. Um, well, I think um, now's the time we need to move on to our next musical performer, yes. which I'm, I'm glad to, to have her. Uh, next up is Jess Garland. Yes. Uh, she's a very dear friend of mine. Uh, Jess runs a nonprofit called Swan Strings out of Dallas, which provides uh, free guitar lessons and music uh, therapy to uh, underprivileged children. Um, very privileged in myself to be a member of the board of Swan Strings and to help facilitate that. And I'm just so proud and, and honored to be connected to her. She's yeah. a really amazing, amazing artist and activist doing good things. And yes. she's a multi-instrumentalist. Yes. Uh, she's open for well-known artists like uh, Ginger Shinkar. Wow. Uh, she's the featured harp on These Machines Are Winning's award-winning album, uh, Slaves for God, wow. as well as um, the Sunshine Village album, The Buffalo Tree Saved the Children of the Sun. Uh, and her debut single, Glow, is out now. Yes. So without further ado, uh, let us hear from Jess Garland. Jess Garland. I try, I try. 
Wow. <laughs> like, that was amazing. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Jess Garland, uh, for sure. And, you know, listening to Jess sing about her glow um, really makes me think about how everyone described Mont and his glowing personality, yeah. you know, um, and, and the way that Mont had this really remarkable ability to make other people shine. And, yeah. and bring out the best in them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what's so disheartening about this family's struggle to mm -hmm. get answers mm -hmm. um, and, and they're being denied an explanation as to how and why yeah. Mont's glow was put out. Yeah. You know, and, wow. and, and that's why we're here together tonight to ensure that as a community, uh, we can put our glow mm -hmm. together yeah. and put a spotlight on injustice. Yeah. You know, that's what this is about. Um, we're going to surround Mont's family yeah. with love and light and support to see them through and make sure that we get justice. We are going to get justice we're for Lamont Stowers Jones. Yes. And if justice comes in the form, it, it, it's really a very simple form at this point. Justice comes in the form of answers. Yes. You know, justice comes, justice comes in the form of accountability. Truth. And in truth and transparency. Yes. And that's what we're here to do tonight, um, to get that. So just a reminder that by the end of tonight's live bro broadcast, which Jessica has already said, but I'm gonna say it again. We aim to raise $10,000 towards the Jones family, um, their investigative fund. And so far we've raised $2,600 and we need to raise $7,400 more. So in the next hour, you know, every little bit helps. Um, send the link, Justice Vermont, to friends, um, and family. I know everybody knows someone that would be concerned about Lamont's story. Um, if you know people who love justice and do the work of justice, or people who love children, um, teachers, any of your friends, your family, share this link, share the live um, on your social media. Just share, share, share. Text, send this to your friends. Um, if you haven't yet, or if you're just tuning in, be sure to check out, again, justicevermont.com, uh, where you can find links to make a direct donation, buy a memorial t-shirt, um, bid in our online auction, art auction, um, which all goes towards our goal of $10,000 to help fund an independent investigation into the mysterious death of Lamont Stowers Jones. Also keep in mind that when you make a direct contribution, you also have the option of sending a direct message um, of support to Mont's family, some of which we're going to share right now. Yeah, we do yeah. have a few. So first off, we wanna give a shout out to uh, LaDonna Stein with Dallas Pinup, who just donated $200. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your contribution. Thank you. Once again, just a prime example of how uh, other individuals and people outside of Denton mm -hmm. are rallying in support of this family. Absolutely. And I just want to use that. I'm calling you out, Denton. Come on, Denton. Don't, don't let Dallas and Fort Worth show yeah. you up. This is right. our community. This is yes. our city. And while we welcome those contributions Absolutely. from across the state and the nation, uh, we are really looking at you, Denton, to step up and step out. And a little bit goes a long way. Absolutely. Um, also, I want to take some time to uh, just share some messages of encouragement from some of our, our local community members who have also made contributions. Mm -hmm. Josh and Ashley Carazales say, our hearts grieve for you. Uh, yes. Thank you for sharing your, your son's beautiful story. 
uh, in light of um, it being tragically cut short yes. and that they are praying for justice with us. Uh, also, Tia Duncan says, may God continue to bless and keep your family as you seek answers and justice, Vermont. Uh, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, just, just everybody making justice uh, for all members of Denton's community a priority Absolutely. in their life. Yeah. Right. So thanks, you, say, thanks so much, guys, um, for all of you who are donating, buying shirts, bidding on art, artwork, and showing your support for the Jones family. We know that this is a big goal, but we also know that together we can do anything. You know Mont was the type of child, or you're learning to know that he was the type of child who embraced the same ideology. We've heard from his family, his mom, mother, father, his siblings. He was a kid with big dreams and big aspirations. Let's hear from his family again and learn more about Mont's aspirations. When Lamont was uh, 15 years old, we uh, took a family trip down to Dallas uh, to the House of Wax Museum. And in the House of Wax, you had a lot of podiums and pictures of famous people. Um, Lamont, at the time, he saw uh, Barack Obama, Obama, and then right next to Barack Obama, they actually have a, a podium, uh, the presidential podium. And Lamont just got behind the podium, stood there and said, well, uh, one day I'm gonna be president, kind of stood there and so on, like, acting like he was talking like if he was the president. Um, so, you know, he definitely had big ambitions. He also um, always had to be the president at the church. In the church uh, Christmas play or whatever play they was having, he always had to be the president. It was what, uh, 2014, um, we went down to Galveston. It was just a spare moment vacation. It was pretty amazing what happened. Was, I actually remember this. It was actually the 4th of July. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, because we got lucky and the hotel that we found was actually at the beginning of where the cars lined up uh, for the uh, parade. Uh, also, we also was able to get directly across from the beach. Um, Lamont, Lamont, uh, and Laura and Loretta, they all enjoyed that because one, we could stand on our balcony and actually look out and see the parade and also maybe 100 feet walk across the street uh, to the beach and go put your feet in there, swim, uh, or, or or whatever we wanted to do. Um, uh, Lamont, he really did love to swim, but um, when he looked out there at the ocean, he said, that's a little bit too much water for me, which is too much dirt. Too much dirt. Uh, Lamont was a type of kid that, um, probably been raised by his mother had more uh you say feels of dirt and being dirty yes didn't want to be dirty yeah <laughs> he was not that type of kid yeah. so i love that pic of Mont behind uh, the president's podium yeah, it was me too. awesome yeah sums up his really big personality as a kid who really loved life and had big plans and dreams and aspirations We've dedicated uh, first, the first part of the program to honoring his life um, because it's critical to remember that like all black people and people of color who have been violently taken from our communities before our time, he and they are so much more than the tragic end that they face. Yeah. Uh, Mont was a student, he was a musician, he was an athlete, he was a friend, a brother, a son, um, and we should point out too how at the end of, Mont, uh, of that last clip, Mont's parents discussed his fear and distaste for dirt and being dirty because that's a big part of the story, the narrative that they've been fed that goes completely against who he was and his fear of how, I mean, there are just so many holes in the story. And so um, his dad talking about how he, the fishing story, how he wouldn't want to go in the water with his dad. And so these repeated intimate experiences with your children that allow you to know them better than anyone else. Like a mama knows, a mom and dad, they know their child. 
I, I, my mom used to say, I know my children. And I, I can say, I know my children. And I know that Amy and Lerman, they know their children and they knew Lamont. And they, you know what your child has a propensity to do. And if somebody comes and tells you, my child did this, well, they probably did do that. <laughs> Versus my child did this. No, that's not, that's not something that my child would do. Right. And so it's, it's like we are stripping them of just the dignity and honor of being parents. Like they don't know who their child is and that they don't have a right to question um, some of these things that they've been told. And so just these, again, these repeated intimate experiences with your children that allow you to know them better than anybody else. You know what kind of person they are, what they are and are not capable of and what they are and aren't willing to do. Yeah, and, and maybe uh, now's a good time to address the official narrative for some of those out there who aren't familiar. Um, and that is that in November 2018, um, the, the family was told by Denton County officials uh, who supposedly coordinated with state game wardens and Texas Rangers um, to determine that in November, when temperatures were between you know, 45, 50 degrees max at 11.30 in the morning, right. that Mont was with a group of friends at Goatman's Bridge, or Old Dalton Bridge as it's more officially known, um, and spontaneously stripped down to his underwear in 45 degree weather yeah. at 11.30 in the morning, and jumped from a bridge 16 feet, a child who we now know was afraid of heights. Right. Right. Um, into murky, stagnant water mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Hickory Creek. This child, who uh, was quite frankly afraid of dirt, didn't want to get dirty, wouldn't right. do this. Um, he, we're supposed to believe, and the family was told to, that they needed to believe that Mont jumped into this stagnant creek. Um, and, and we know that that not only would, would Mont um, not have jumped into the creek because it would have been dirty and right. uh, I wouldn't have jumped in. I, don't, I, I know that some kids may have done it in the summer when the creek is moving and it's bright um, and the water's high, but this was not the case at exactly. the time in November. Exactly. Certainly not in November 2018. We can pull the, 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 the data to know that. Uh, exactly what the temperature was and exactly what the water looked like. You know, it's not difficult to do that in this day and age. Right. Um, so Mont's parents know better than anyone that this is just not something Mont would do. Right. Um, and they can be trusted. Right. And, and this <laughs> is something that that's, that's quite frankly so difficult about this story is that not only, it's not that no one believed him, it's that the authorities didn't care to hear it. Uh, that this aspect wasn't important to them, this concept that Mont's family would know Mont better than, than them, and quite frankly, that they didn't care to know. To do the due diligence. Right. Yeah. Right. And in and, and, and learning these details, one of the, the persons that I spoke with most uh, was Angela James, and she's Mont's aunt. Mm -hmm. And very early on, uh, after Mont passed away, she became a spokesperson yeah. for uh, Mont's family. And... She, more than anyone, has really helped me kind of unravel the details of this troubling investigation. And so I think now is a time uh, to go to Angela James and yeah. hear um, how she experienced that go. Yeah. The last time my mom was seen alive when Lerman dropped him off at the county municipal courthouse. He had taken him there to take care of some paperwork and um, he was expected to come home later that evening and possibly hang out with a friend during the day. So it wasn't um, out of the norm when he didn't um, come home that evening. So they just assumed he spent the night with a friend. So it wasn't until the next day they had um, noticed a, just, just a weird interaction when they were at, was at Laura's basketball game. After the basketball game, the family went home and Lerman went on his day of work and um, while out working, he received a strange phone call from a city of Denton police officer alerting to who didn't identify himself, alerting him to the fact that state and county officials were looking for Lermont in the uh, waters of Hickory Creek, better known as Goatman's Bridge. So after a series of strange phone calls the family received regarding Lermont, 
um, they were informed after a series of divers and you know search by uh, robotic equipment that they were not able to find his body and it was maybe the family should search for him around town so the family went looking for him all over town driving around the family in tow thinking that they were going to find Lamont and um, Amy became increasingly worried so she asked for Lerman to call back and that's when they were alerted to the fact that his body had been recovered and they needed to come to identify his body. After the phone call, the family went to identify the body and uh, from that point forward, they received no contact from any authority, county, state, city, nobody contacted them to give them any information regarding their son. The only information that they seen was information that was spread in the press. So I think now is a good time to just kind of, to help clarify yeah. um, and, and just recap what we've learned so far. Yeah. And that is that the last time that Lermont Stowers Jones was seen alive by his family was on the first day of his Thanksgiving break on Monday, November 19th, 2018, when he was dropped off in the parking lot of the Denton County Courthouse by his father. And Mont told his family that it was likely gonna hang out with a friend uh, after that. Um, he was gonna give him a call if he needed a ride um, unfortunately, Mont never called and he never came home that night. Now, as a 17 year old boy, uh, Mont's mom, Amy, explained to me, you know, it, wasn't, it wouldn't be the first time that he had spent the night with a friend and forgotten to call. And I can reflect back as a teenager myself, and yeah. uh, I definitely had a few of those on my scorecard too, you right, know? Right. So while Mont's family wasn't particularly alarmed, they were more disappointed, you right. know? Like, ah, oh, he didn't call, you yeah. know? Um, it wasn't until the next day, on November 20th, 2018, uh, that the family knew something was terribly wrong. That's when Mont's father uh, got a series of very strange phone calls, um, which were able to trace back to very specific people and agencies and exact times, because of course we can access Lerman's phone records. Right. And that's exactly what we did. So I wanna take just a minute for everybody who's tuned in right now to recap those phone calls. Yeah. So at 12.26 p.m. on November 20th, 2018, Lerman Jones got a call from an unknown City of Denton police officer who didn't identify themselves, they didn't identify themselves by name, just that they were an officer with the City of Denton. And they tell Lerman Jones that officials have been searching for the body of Lermont Stowers Jones in the, in the waters of Hickory Creek at Goatman's Bridge since the previous day. Now immediately, you know, Lerman responds, oh, you, you've got the wrong, you got the wrong kid. That's not possible. My kid didn't jump in the water. He knows his kid. He's, right. My kid's not playing around in that creek. You got the wrong kid. And so then he hangs up and at 12.40 p.m., about 15 minutes later, he gets a call back from the same officer, and we know that this call came from the city of Denton internal police line because we look the phone number up right. and it's a virtual world and we can do those things. Right. And so the same officer calls back and he tells Lerman the same information again. He says, oh yeah, they're definitely looking for your son. And he tells him, I'm gonna have a game warden give you a call back. So now at 12.47 p.m., seven minutes later, Lerman gets a phone call from Game Warden Captain uh, Clifford Swafford, and we know that because the phone number traces back to Captain Swafford's personal cell phone. And Captain Swafford then reports to Lerman that it had been reported to officials that Mont had jumped into the waters the previous morning. 
and that county officials had, and state officials had been looking for Mont's body at that point now for more than 24 hours. But he tells Lermont at the, or Lerman at this time that he thinks there's been a mistake made too. He doesn't think it's possible that Lermont is in that creek either because they've used drones, they've had underwater divers, and in 24 hours they haven't been able to find anything. And so he tells Lerman, you should probably be out looking for your son. And so now the, whole, the family at 12.47 p.m., they're sent out on this wild goose chase to look for Lermont. They drive around Denton. They go to all of his friends' houses, all the places where they know Lermont might be, desperately looking for Lermont. And of course, as time goes by, at this point, Lerman has his wife, Amy, Lermont's mother, and their three surviving children still in the home. Uh, they're, they're all in the car. And they're all looking for Mont. And as time goes by, Amy becomes increasingly anxious. All right. She's thinking, she, you know, she says, well, wait a minute, I just don't understand. Why would they even think that Lermont would be in that water? I don't understand. So she tells Lerman, call the game warden back. And so at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on November 20th, 2018, an hour and 34 minutes after Lerman got the first phone call from a city of Denton police officer, Lerman calls the game warden back. And Captain Swafford immediately answers his phone and he tells Lerman, we just pulled your son's body out of Hickory Creek. We need you to come identify the body or else you're gonna have to go to Fort Worth to do it. And so processing this, I, I wanna point out a few things. The first thing I want to point out is that from the very beginning, Lermont's family had to make the phone call to find out that their son was dead. Right. It's not that they even got the courtesy of a phone call, if you want right. to call it that. They had to pursue from the very moment of finding out this tragic information. And after being sent on this wild goose chase in this series of strange phone calls, but it gets weirder. So later that evening, on November 20th, 2018, the day that Mont's body is recovered, the Denton Record Chronicle publishes a very short article about the fact that a child has been recovered from the waters of Hickory Creek. And they quote, they take a direct quote from Argyle Assistant Fire Chief Michael Lugo. And this assistant fire chief, who is reportedly, self-admittedly in charge of directing the recovery of Mont's body, he tells the Denton Record Chronicle, in a direct quote, that they recovered the body of Lermont Stowers Jones around 12.15 p.m. Now, I want to direct your attention back to the fact that the very first phone call came to Lerman Jones at 12.26 p.m., And for nearly two hours, yeah. this family was driving around looking for this, their child. So when was Lermont Stowers Jones recovered from the waters of Hickory Creek? We don't know right. exactly. Right. These are simple details that should be known. And yet they're not. And this to everyone watching, what I want you to understand, because this is an ongoing investigation, it may not be for local authorities, but if any local authorities are watching right now, I'd also like to send you a message and make this very clear. We are still investigating. This is an open investigation. And we will get the truth. And we will get justice for Lermont Stowers Jones. Because these types of in, indiscrepancies in the narrative are just in the beginning what set the tone. And there's so much more. Oh, yeah. And we're going to get in to some more of those details tonight as we talk more to Mont's family. But in order to do that, of course, 
we have to be able to fund this independent investigation with experts. Yeah. Yeah. And so far, we've raised $3,188. Okay. That's great. So we we're need getting there. We're almost over. halfway yeah, there. Yeah, almost. So if you haven't yet, or if you're just tuning in, be sure to check out www.justicevermont.com, where you can find links to make a direct donation, buy a memorial t-shirt, or bid in our online art auction, all of which goes towards our goal of $10,000 to help fund Mont's family's independent investigation. It's really heavy, you know, just to yeah. sit here. I've yeah. told this, I've been a part of this narrative for a while now. Right. You know, I've come to know Lerman and Amy and their surviving children as friends. Their, their family is my family now. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is because it could be your son. Yes. It could be your child. We cannot count on police to solve murders. It isn't what they do, and it's certainly not what's done for black and brown families. And so we do have a goal tonight, and I just want to encourage everyone to, to be sure to take the extra step and, and make that extra outreach to get us to our goal. Yes. Um, for now, I think it's time we get back to Angela James, and let's get some more pertinent details regarding the development of the investigation from the family's perspective. Yeah. While the county and state officials provided no information to my family, they regularly updated press. So they completely ignored the family, yet continued to provide information, conflicting information, I might add, to the press. At first, they claimed Lamont was at the bridge with one other kid and willingly jumped into the water. Then a few days later, the authorities told the press that there was two kids at the scene. Then we learned in another article that the Denton County officials were in charge of the investigation. And then it wasn't a few days later that the game warden reported to Fox News that he had ultimately determined that it was an accident and Lamont jumped in the water on his own and drowned. All the while, no one talked to the family regarding whether if Mont could swim. They didn't contact him, provide any information at all. It wasn't until after the family was able to finally bury Lamont that we um, began to seek for answers. And I took a leading role in helping the family to uh, find out what happened, pressing the authorities to give us some information about what happened to him on that day. So it's just unfathomable to imagine that after Mont's body was discovered in the way that it was, and in light of the fact that witnesses fled the scene, then repeatedly lied to authorities about who was there, that not a single investigator ever contacted them to ask any questions. Yeah, and it's just, uh, again, there seems to be some just standard things that we take for granted yeah. that just didn't happen. I mean, absolutely. for instance, um, while Denton uh, County has gone out of their way to avoid providing open records, uh, public information uh, requested by the family, mm -hmm. we have been able to get some records, uh, one of which was a copy of the game warden's report, and we were able to get that because it's filed with the state. That's a state agency. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just another prime example of some information we're able to gather from that report, which was filed on November 28th, uh, 2018, seven days after Mont was recovered from the water of Hickory Creek. Um, and this form, it's a, it's a standard accident form that's filled out any time uh, an individual is recovered from a public body of water. Right. And, and just a few things I want to point out from that report. Mm -hmm. uh, in the fields inquiring as to, there's some just standard questions that are asked there. And there's a, a, a field there that says, uh, could the victim swim? 
and there's check boxes. Yes, no, unknown. Marked unknown. unknown. Did the victim drink or use drugs? Yes, no, or unknown. Unknown. Did the victim have any physical disabilities? Mental disabilities? Right. Yes, no, or unknown? Unknown. These are things that it would seem to any logical individual as necessary to know one way or another right. when you're investigating a questionable death relating a to a drowning. Right. Right. And yet no investigator at any point ever saw fit to, ask his to call his family or, God forbid, to show up in person. Right. And ask a member of Mont's family one of these questions. Or even ask them on scene when they came to identify Mont's body in the back of an ambulance on the side of the road. These, when we talk about the injustices served to this family, the blatant failures of local law enforcement, I cannot emphasize enough that, of course, these are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this case. We obviously can't share everything right. um, that we know. But we do know this, that unfortunately, once the family did get to have a conversation with investigators, they ended up with just more questions than answers. And I think that uh, to better understand that, let's just go back and, and hear some more from Angela James. I think she yeah. summarizes that well. It wasn't until December 2nd after contacting the uh, county officials repeatedly that we were finally told by a third party um, that we could have a meeting. It was though they were definitely trying to avoid the family at all costs. They didn't want to speak with us at all. So finally on uh, December 2nd, we were informed of the meeting, I think the Thursday before. From the beginning, it was obvious who was running the show. Um, that was Texas Ranger, Claire Barnes. Um, he, from the outset, um, came across as though we were not victims. He had no empathy or concern about Lamont. Um, he knew the whole story. He just wanted to, you know, excuse any other thoughts that we had, gather what information that we thought, and then quickly dismiss it. So he, he had all the answers. He was a know-it-all, and we were just really like um, little peons that he was privileged, that we were privileged to talk to, was the impression that I got. Um, so it was very odd that we're coming here to seek answers regarding the death of our loved one. And you're acting as though he's nothing. It doesn't matter. Um, and we should just go away. So um, his description of the event was really primarily focused on making us understand that there was only black people there. That's who was at the scene, was black people. He made it clear that that's what we should know from the beginning. And it was though that the ranger didn't um, think Lermont, Lerman knew his son. Um, so he didn't think he knew his friends. Um, and he, he played up to that. And uh, Lerman remembered only one of the names of the persons that he mentioned he knew of, which happened to be a white kid that lived in the neighborhood. So again, from that perspective on, we really were like, okay, well, what are you really trying to do here? Are you trying to, to create a narrative? I mean, that was clear from the outset because of he, him guiding the discussion and guiding what we thought about who was there when it was, didn't coincide with the knowledge that we knew from the beginning. So it was from that point on that we were couldn't believe anything that he said. So, gross negligence, hmm. indifference, 
disrespect, lack of common decency, racist, just black people, racialization, criminalization, incompetence. Just some words that have run through my mind. Um, and Jessica, you've worked closely with the family on the case. Yeah, I, um, it, it never gets any easier to hear. <laughs> it never becomes any more palatable as many times as I've heard the story, as many times as I've heard the details. And I've interviewed the family and, um, and that's how we, we got together last year at the protest yeah. on the square. That's where we met. Yeah. And um, I wanted to, I have a podcast and um, I wanted to be able to tell the stories of local people because so oftentimes people think those problems, and you've heard, we, we hear that, that doesn't happen in Denton, that happens in Los Angeles or Chicago or, you know, New York, wherever. It doesn't happen in Denton, but, but it happened in Denton. It's happening in Denton, and it's not the only case. Right. As, as, as we saw at the Black Lives Matter protest, many people had stories of being snatched out of cars. There's another young man who was murdered. Darius, Darius Tarver. Tarver. Say his name. Say his name. And I, I'm just at a loss for words. I'll take over for a minute. Yeah, go ahead. So I think it's important to just recap uh, some of the details that we've learned so far. And that's that after Mont's body was recovered on November 20th, 2018, it was 15 days later. 15 days before authorities spoke to the family of Lermont Stowers Jones. And in their first meeting, all authorities did was seek to gather information from the family in regards to what they thought they knew. Right. They weren't interested in hearing anything from the family that, that the family thought might be helpful to the investigation. Instead, they were interested in pushing a narrative. They bring in uh, Denton County Sheriff's Office, who was supposedly leading the investigation, immediately brings in Texas Ranger Claire Barnes. And this in and of itself is strange because typically the Texas Rangers are called in to investigate homicides, a fact that the Ranger himself made very clear mm. to Lamont's family. And yet he was brought in to convince the family that it wasn't a homicide. So why are you involved? So why would he be involved? And I should point out that this Texas Ranger is actually a former Texas Ranger. Right. He was recently retired, but now uh, a beat cop at the University of North Texas, but not before he was called in to lead the investigation into the murder by cop of Darius Tarver right here in Denton, Texas. So when we talk about the systemic nature of police brutality and injustice, in regards to racism, this is exactly what we're talking about. And Ranger Barnes, if you're listening, that's right. I called you a racist. Well, and when you talk about racial profiling, this man fits a, bro a profile himself by way of his actions and behavior. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to profile someone just based on the color of their skin, which we know is racism. Right. But it's another, it's another thing to see a pattern in this man's career. Yes and history yes. and how they treated one black family and another black family and knee-jerk reactions that leads to, to the death of another young black man. Well, and we have to point out one thing that I want people to take away from Angela James's um, last interview there. She points out how when the family first gets to this, this meeting with investigators, yeah. the first thing that happens is the ranger tells them, he starts listing names of people, witnesses who were supposedly at the scene. Right. And the first name that the ranger gives is the name of a white neighbor of the, fam of the Jones family, mm -hmm. a white teen who lives behind them, at which point 
but the ranger identifies this teen as black. And so Lerman Jones says, oh, no, no, you got, you got it wrong. Actually, that's, that's a white kid, just so you know. And at this point, it becomes this argument with the ranger. And then when he realizes he's miscategorized the skin color of this kid, right. all of a sudden this kid disappears. Right. He's no longer a part of the narrative. Because he said, isn't he the one that said that everyone that was there were just black? It was just, it was black, just people, black people. Which is, why is that even? Right. But then it just becomes a, the point, like Angela says, at that point, why would the family believe anything right. that, the, that the investigators are telling them? I mean, you, I want people to ask themselves, what would you believe? What would you believe? It's not about race, right? Well, apparently it was for someone. Because he had to point out that everyone there were just black people, including the white kid that wasn't black. Right. So when we talk about, again, this is why we're here tonight. We know that we can't count on the local officials to get us to the answers that we need, but we can get there, and we are getting there. We are getting these answers. And one of the really important things that we're working towards now are additional experts that we need to help us figure out some of the details that uh, basic research isn't going to get us. And that's why it's so important that we meet our goal tonight. And so far, uh, we're, we're working towards $10,000. Right. Um, so far, I just tallied it up. We are just shy of the halfway mark. We just got a slew of uh, donations, thank which I'm you really all. excited about. Yes, thank you so much. We're at almost $5,000. Um, and some of you have been sending in some really uh, amazing messages yeah. in support of the family. I just want to read a few of those really quick. Yeah. Um, Let's see, first we have uh, Ann Strickland uh, contributed $50 and said, it's an honor to learn more about Lermont mm. and to join you in this fight for Thank justice. You. Sending love from our family to yours. Uh, and I just wanna let you know that um, Lermont's family is right here in yeah. uh, getting that message in real time. And so yeah. it does make an impact and thank you. Yeah. Um, also, we had uh, Barbara Woods uh, contributed $100 and said, we love you and we are praying for justice. Amen. Uh, we also have another uh, message here uh, from uh, Carson Yates says, my heart is with your family and I am praying for justice. Mm. So again, you guys, there are a lot of ways that you can contribute and help us to reach our goal. We're halfway there. We need a big push from everyone. Now is the time yes. to go to justicevermont.com to make that contribution, to buy a t-shirt, to bid on artwork, and to take the time to share that link with friends Absolutely. and family and get other people involved to help us reach our goal because it's gonna take all of us as yeah. a community. And no amount is too small. No. No amount is too small. Just put, put your heart into whatever you're giving um, to love and serve this family and help Lermont Stowers Jones to get justice. Well, I think uh, now is a good time to take a break uh, and introduce our next musical guest. Yeah. Yeah. You want to do that? Sure. So we're going to bring in Archetype. Archetype, next yeah. Page. I got to um, listen to him perform, and I just love his vibe. Like I was saying, he's like a, a, Jill, a Gil St Scott Heron of our time. Totally. Um, I think I, he would appreciate that, yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> it's that jazz, uh, but then that spoken word, and then that just the talk back. There's so many elements to just rap. Everybody labels rap as like, there's so many pieces to rap. And I really enjoy not only his words, which are powerful, he's definitely a truth teller. Um, mm -hmm. He's gonna use some very powerful words. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes that's what's called for to express the anger um, and the frustration that we feel. And so I, I want you guys to listen to his words. We've had so much diverse diversity in the music so far. And I mean, it's been amazing. It's been powerful uh, to see um, uh, a harpist play and to hear gospel music. And now we're going to hear rap and spoken words. So let's, let's listen to Archetype. And before we go, I just want to point out that Archetype did just release his latest album, Collage, which okay. is out on all major retailers now. Yes. And we're going to hear some of that tonight. So awesome. yes, without further ado, Archetype. Uh, 
Old school, I'm an ocean, you're a swimming pool Been the cool cat with rhymes from here to Istanbul Ridicule, fill it float through your ventricles Pencils making mass movements of all the molecules What's the origin of violence? I don't know though Why do the police murder the man? Silence, yo Maybe my mind needs a new alignment But the chemistry in me say I'm better living through science Back to these whack MCs, rapping faculty Actually, three of them still don't equal half of me I pack my herbs like I have to leave I'm getting low like I'm scuba Steve I feel the weight, but I gotta breathe I'm Rick Rubin mixed with Rick Rube Quick movements, pass a picnic noose Your stuff needs ingredients, dude I swim with high pressure, seaweed is my food How could I care about Miller Quentin when I'm reinventing? And an actual ghost, okay, the words I'm spitting the body is a car, the mind is an engine Releasing tension, sit and listen now to the mental venting Penny pension prescriptions, addicted to pencil pissing People still ask me to paraphrase, why you tense then? Cause you got bars and no conviction I see you when I play whack shit, fuck your faction Do something, go practice Live as a waiter, feel as an actress I'm in Atlantis, stuffing my raps under the mattress The point is to stick out like a cactus Down to earth arachnid, burnt back a rack and jab shit Stuffed in a napkin, I guess that shit happened I know why when you see me you got the sour face Cause you've been trying to bite me but you got no taste You can't be me, you just a photocopy Wearing Adidas, don't know that they came from Nazis Don't you know that I can put you with under the beats Roar like four cause I am one with the thunder Everything in your text stale I walk away from the flame Like I'm in waiting to exhale Don't give a fuck though, Chuck bro, look with gumbo Don't duck slow, good fortune with blood slow Throw flows and I'm gung-ho, still dirty like the water in Flint Look at the big picture, don't adjust the tent Playing spades, not poker when I'm up in the game I'm clutching the reins, don't you know I'm fucking insane My rap feng shui, will rearrange your brain Style's kinetic, I leave it embedded I write where I'm headed, poetic, phonetic You're the least energetic, I said it, I meant it Neo-Nazi lames gotta charge it to the game Debit the credit, the world will end if we let it My rap style's Reddit, so I'm still studying Kemet Know the past to repeat it, this is food for thought Can't make you eat it, mine's a furnace But I can't make you eat it, the cycle of hate gets repeated They'll tell us We'll need it, play the national anthem, get mad if we stay seated Unapologetic, I'm bothered yet unleveled and still hot headed. On pot, not dreaded. Getting props, unlocking evil cops on Reddit with gas, unleaded. Earth embedded, the rocks don't get enough credit. Putting together all of the documents shredded. The sequence doctor got chopped and beheaded. Watch where you treading. Cause when the clock hits 11, the leaves start to deaden. And the wolf gets to shredding, you shit in your bedding. Asking the reverend why you locked out of heaven. The church closed at 7. Motherfucker. Uh, Oversampled grammar you can't compare And my rhymes go over heads like a solar flare Charles Xavier with a red stare And without a chair plus I got hair and a new snare Tied rope in a carnival that's not fair I got a pair with no VPN on sock share Nightcrawler how I got there uh, Nightcrawler how I got there Phone bet. 
Another kick I shot and I ain't even have my eggs yet Take a shot and let my head rest Best stress, my chest release, stress and manifest And then, it's on into the day Sun gets on our every praise Through the violence every rays I'm that spiritual, lyrical, miracle, filthy frank The artist on heroes is the way I paint Get it rockin' and more shit King Cooper with the fire flying out of the fortress You lying when you rhyming just forfeit My forearms force forward shit you cannot forget Cancer patient every day I get more sick The world's a pie chart and I'm demanding a portion Verbal painting without all the distortion Placing a wave sculpture then wrapped up in porcelain Concentrate niggas hating, ovulating, so I'm a lake and I'm a bake I'm in the past, I move irrationally, cast to see a black struggle Man, who told you what calf to be? No time to cry, sigh and walk past the homicides I'm glad I'm alive, but I'm mad like I'm a stud All problems we face, it gets no clearer The infection and the reflection of a black mirror Life impacted through taxes, rain and wax and a rack and rack and jack and jackets In the back of a sax with pack and the irony We love 808s, police give us the beats And by daylight in the middle of the street Bold feet, they use the heat, no cold feet If they pull you to the side, no doubt Don't speak past the fifth on this classic shit After this masochist will say You can have my ass to kiss Too. If it weren't for you, meddling crews, and better to lose. It's a rabbit hole like Kedem and you. Better recognize the evil lies embedded in you. I'm hungry and I'm headed for food. A skipping stone was a pebble to use. My blood's got a warrior that's ready to fuse. I use my blood to paint the hues. Creative, I'm used. I'm stating the truth. The loser to the news. Take a cruise. Loosen the screws. Politicians give us the blues. Since here we Lewis in the news. Part of the partisan while I play my part and make art again. My heart is on my card again. How's Tay Rock on the card again? I'm sparring with bars and arguments. My nigga made his homie smoke catnips. Facts trick back quick. I feel a Charlie Flash kick. I hang with the Ada, but I'm not with theatrics. But I'd be remiss to not take a split for a new strand to breathe Post a sipping, left hand whipping, ripping rapids Drifting traffic, Mr. Magic, out of nowhere comes a rabbit Don't be pissed cause your shit is tragic It's time to get rid of the dragons Be skilled when it happens, prepare the mind and the body will follow I know your models are actually evil and hollow I lighten up like little Lago You'll get the point when I charge like a rhino Rapping, I need a nice sense of fetus Fresh at the speed, sticking great to repeat it Unscathed to complete it, invading your regions Separada de mi El quererme o Each one home never made Each one home never made Yo, uh 
traveling through space and time, I'm unjaveling. Hi hat rattling, battling cats at the La Madeline. Claiming I'm sadder than all the moons on Saturn. I'm raveling the Madden and new cattle, brand and pattern. Merciless feats, turn my purpose to beats. Hurdling heaps on bourbon, the sweet and the burgundy Jeep. On Ferguson Street, I lurk and I creep. I think I'm working this week. Put your neck, I'm working the week. Hit a hurt in the speech. Hercules, hermetically, find a purpose to be. I'm purple percolating the tea. My life is what I made it to be. Yo, boy, mateys, yeah, I made it to see. In jeans more faded than me, I'm ready to leave. I'm a legend grieving. Ready to leave. I'm ready to leave. Survive, struggle, and strife. Food for thought, man, it's best with the rice. I'm the chef with the knife. Uh. Rapping if the recipe's right. Holding a drink that is spike. It's hot water and pipe. Me and the system, yeah, we're kind of alike. Only because we want to give you life. Funny how my left hand writes. I'm my best man, that's the best advice. Throwing a vest for my flesh at night. My head is the light. I'm bolder, you a sediment type. I'm the what I said I meant type. Uh. Veteran, you can see the pinstripes. I got a flow just for Flint, right? Archetype, his message is so straight to the point. Um, there's no confusing his calls um, out, you know, against injustice. Clear, concise, to the point. And of course, nothing at all like the communication Mont's family received from local authorities after his body was recovered in Hickory Creek at Old Alton Bridge, better known locally as Goatman's Bridge, a site notorious in the Denton community for its legendary association with violent clan murders and horror stories born out of the area's very real and extensively documented history of racial violence during the early 20th century. It's interesting because we're starting to see more and more like film mm -hmm. work about, I don't know if you've heard, uh, seen Lovecraft Country. Oh yeah. Where, and um, even Get Out, mm -hmm. the different films that are coming forward uh, that basically expl express racism as the trauma that it really is and the horror that it really is. Yeah, so. for sure. And, and I mean, I think it's important, you know, if we really want to understand yeah. the disturbing circumstances regarding Mont's death, I, I mean, it, we have to address the location associated, Absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if you're not familiar, if you're not a Denton local, you may not know, but I would imagine most local Dentonites are familiar with the legend of Goatman's Bridge, which right. is uh, basically the, the legend goes that in the 1930s, there was this uh, goat farmer named Oscar Washburn who had become very successful in the local community as this goat farmer. And so he took it upon himself to put a sign on Old Dalton Bridge, which at the time uh, was the only bridge going into the south part of the community. And apparently this upset the local Klansmen mm -hmm. who, after seeing the sign and were disturbed by Oscar Washburn's success, uh, as legend has it, they showed up to the Washburn family home, uh, pull this goat farmer out of his home, hang him, lynch him from the bridge, uh, and then there's this, you know, ghost story tied into it that then when they go down to the bank to, you know, see him hanging from the bridge, they find an empty noose. This upsets them more. And so they go and they remove the entire family from the Washburn home, the mother and his two children, uh, or excuse me, they, they leave them there. They, they, the, as burn legend the has house. it, they burn the house down yeah. with them inside. And yeah. it's, this, it's this gruesome, gory legend that, it's, it's how Old Dalton Bridge came to be known as Goatman's Bridge, and, right. and most people didn't know about this legacy. And let me be clear, local historians have tried to find evidence of this Oscar Washburn thus far unsuccessfully, but it's also important to note that these types of urban myths around these stories exist out of very real history. Right. Denton and Denton County in particular have very real and thoroughly documented histories of violent clan activity, multiple lynchings. And it's out of this very real history mm -hmm. of white on black violence, especially in the early 20th century when black communities were becoming more independent yeah. and economically um, trying to uh, prosper without white endorsement. Right. Um, and it's this real history that breathes these myths. And what I find particularly disturbing and disgusting about the way that these myths work 
is the way that they're used to um, sensationalize yes. the idea of, of white vigilante violence on black bodies. And, and a prime example of this, I mean, you can go right now, even though, even though, as I just explained, there's no documented evidence of that particular incident involving this supposed Oscar Washburn. There's no historical evidence of it, and yet you can go to the Denton County Office of History and Culture right now. Do it quick before they delete it after they get called out. And you can see a link to businesses owned by local white residents who are taking people on haunted ghost tours of Goatman's Bridge. Right sensationalizing this, yeah. this mythos. And so we can't separate that. No, you as, can't. From the fact that this is where Mont's body is discovered in these strange circumstances. We're just supposed to dismiss this association. That we still don't know all the details because, well, we know more details from fam the family's own investigation, but right. we don't know all the details from the sheriff's department because of their resistance to share what really happened. It's all crazy. Um, but just even that capitalization off of black trauma. Right. Because that story had to come from somewhere. Um, and 1930 was not that long ago. It had to come from somewhere. And that's a, uh, a legend that white and black people in didn't know of. Right. Everybody knows that story. So it didn't just come out of thin air. But things like you know, plantations and plantation weddings and mm -hmm. Civil War reenactments, um, Confederate monuments. We okay. just got the Confederate monument uh, through the work of Willie Hudspeth for 20 something years, mm -hmm. um, got it removed. But it sat right on the county square uh, for years, which is owned by the county. Right. Um, and then just even within a month of Lamont's murder, I will say it, his murder, um, Claire, Baines, Claire Baines, or Claire Barnes. Texas Ranger, he, Claire The Texas Barnes. Ranger, yeah, he took pictures there with his family. At like Goat Man's Bridge. At, at Goat, yeah, it's insensitive. He took a family portrait on Goat Man's Bridge at the very site where Mont supposedly jumped to his death. Less than a month after his death. While he's still supposedly actively investigating Mont's death. Right, who does that? It's difficult to fathom. And unfortunately, the more you learn about Mont's case, the more it becomes clear that nothing makes sense. Nothing. Um, and that said, let's, let's go back to the family. Let's hear some more from Mont's yeah. family about that. We were supposed to believe that these people that no one knew, and we're supposed to believe their stories, and the ranger and both the captain, I mean, they believed them. Lock, stock, and barrel that you know, Lamont had jumped off the bridge and we knew it was a lie because number one, we didn't know those people and they didn't know Lamont. So, you know, the information that they shared was not credible as well as not, it didn't describe Lamont's behavior. It's nothing that he would do. They all flippantly claimed that Lamont immediately disrobed and jumped in the water without provocation. That's where we were supposed to leave. That, that was the big story that the ranger had to tell. He came to the bridge and he just jumped in the water of his own accord. So we were supposed to believe that Lamont took the time to disrobe, took the time to neatly fold his clothes, to jump into the water below 50 degrees that was still and murky. That's what we were supposed to believe. from kids that we don't know, never heard of, never talked to. That's what we're supposed to believe. So the ranger, um, from the outset, he built up his um, investigation. He, he made us to believe that he had this great investigation of information and he knew everything that happened. He, as a matter of fact, he said he knew exactly what happened. Um, and it didn't make sense then, it doesn't make sense now, and it didn't make sense to anybody that knew Lamont. It didn't make sense to the family because of his, um, you know, he, he could swim, which, you know, he could swim, but he wouldn't jump in the water off that bridge. It just, it's just something he wouldn't do. Um, during that meeting, they wanted to make us believe their story. They wanted us to just, disregard any 
mindset or thought process of what we knew or what we knew about Lamont that was supposed to be totally disregarded and we're supposed to believe some kids that we don't know, that don't know Lamont, don't know the family, it didn't come to the funeral, if these are friends of his and it was an accident, didn't come to his funeral, didn't show up, haven't heard from him, from them whatsoever. We were repeatedly told that that's what we're supposed to believe and anything else, you're an idiot, you're stupid, it doesn't make sense. So that's just um, what we were presented with. When we left that day, I, I really realized that we had a fight on our hands. I realized that um, the law wasn't on our side. You know, what they were saying was, didn't make sense to me because they were saying things that didn't make sense and they were believing in them as though it was the gospel. And there was no other theory whatsoever, nothing else to consider. Not to question whether he could swim, not to question, um, you know, what happened to him. They didn't want to hear about the harassment he received, the racial harassment he received, the threats he'd received, um, how his family was, you know, afraid for his life. There was a kid with a gun who was brought to school, you know, that threatened him. Lerman had contacted the authorities, you know, the police, the school officials. They didn't want to hear anything about that. That was totally irrelevant. And, you know, it just made you think that, why are you not trying to consider another angle? Why are these boys believed, you know, as though what they're saying is gospel without any regard for what, you know, anything else, any other version? You know, it just felt as though they were, they had already made their minds up and that was just that. So I knew we had a fight on our hands to get to the truth. A fight on our hands. Yeah. That's what Angela said. I just imagine, I can't even imagine the family wrapping up that first interview with law enforcement and that being the thought in yeah. their minds as they're leaving. We've got a fight on our hands. Yes. I mean, just imagine the devastating feeling of waiting more than two weeks to even talk to law enforcement and to just be dismissed like that. And, and, and I don't know if everyone noticed, I mean, in the middle of all this happening, there's people going out and in the midst of this investigation, they're tagging the site saying things we kill here. Right. And investigators don't find that suspicious. They don't, they don't pay that any mind. Yeah. No one's concerned about that. And, yeah. and they, they just offered this, the family this, this narrative that's completely out of line with what they knew about Mont. Yeah. And all based on the statements of witnesses who all fled the scene, who all admittedly lied. Even the authorities tell the parents that, well, the reason we didn't, you know, get to you sooner is because everybody lied at first. But they're all telling the truth now. <laughs> you know, it, it's, just, it, it's just beyond me. I mean, the family's supposed to believe that? Would you believe it? Right. I wouldn't believe it. I don't believe it, as a matter of fact. I, I don't believe it. I, what, who I do believe is the family. I believe that Lerman and Amy know their son. Exactly. And I believe them when they tell me that Lermont wouldn't jump off that bridge. Um, I believe that I took that picture mm. at the site where people were tagging, we kill here at the location where Lermont's body was discovered. I believe that. Mm, mm, mm. I believe that authorities paid it no mind. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's why we're looking to people to help us continue this investigation. Right. And as we reach into uh, the final segment of our show, so far um, we've raised about how much? We are, I can't, are you ready? I'm ready. I don't think you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Tell me. We just reached $7,200. Awesome. Yes, awesome. we are almost to our goal. We need $2,200 more to reach our goal tonight. So we still need you guys. We need you to donate and support. Go to justicevermont.com. You can find links to make a direct donation, even as low as $10. Nothing is too small. That's right. You can buy a t-shirt. You can bid online um, for the art, art auction. Um, I mean, we, we really need you in this last stretch 
this is the kind of support month, month family, month's family needs. Before um, we go out, I want to read some messages. Oh, go, Do you go, mind? No, go ahead. I'm sorry to cut no, you off. No, absolutely. We You're got fine. some really great messages, and I just want to share a few of them with people here. Um, Robin Duncan says uh, that she is blessed to be able to donate to the family and feeding off of you. She said, uh, May Lermont's killers get what they deserve. Uh, I'm with you, well. friend. Uh, let's see, uh, Janitra McCroy says, sending prayers and love to the family. The truth shall prevail. God will serve justice, and I pray that it comes swiftly. My sister. Oh, love that. My baby sister. Uh, also, Rita Obey, uh, perhaps pronounced Obi. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. Uh, she says, love you guys, uh, and made a $50 contribution. Thank you for that. Uh, also, Jeremiah Dickens says, thoughts and prayers to Lermont and his family during this very sensitive time. Justice, Vermont. That's right. right. Uh, also, Allison McGuire has a special message for Lermont's younger sister, Loretta. Mm. She says, please tell Loretta that Miss McGuire from BMMS sees her mm. and that she's so sorry for your loss. Um, also, uh, Shashenka Lopez purchased a shirt and said, I will wear this shirt and share Mont's story to stand in solidarity with your family in the fight for justice for Lermont. Thank you guys so much. The messages, the donations, the purchases, we can't do it without you. And this is exactly what the family needs. We're going to hear some more from, from Mont's uh, family. So after the meeting, the only time we ever heard from the authorities was when I reached out to them. They didn't reach out to us with any information. Um, they, they totally avoided the family. They treated us as though we were, um, I don't know, like we didn't matter because they didn't contact us. They didn't share information. When we called, it was though we were bothering them. We were trying to you know, find out about the autopsy. We didn't get any information from them whatsoever. So a couple of weeks after the meeting, um, Lerman filed an open records request to receive a copy of the autopsy and he was told that it wasn't available. Um, the very next day, um, Amy is um, alerted to an article that references the autopsy and the results and the fact about the trace amount of marijuana that was supposedly in his blood and which was of course, used to, to criminalize him and to make it appear as though this kid is a is a drug user, and that you know again we should definitely disregard the fact that he's he's gone. So Lamont's mother received the first information regarding his autopsy results from a newspaper article. The request of the family completely ignored, and she has to get her information from a newspaper. So the medical examiner can communicate with them, but they can't communicate with the family. And it wasn't until the Monday I received the autopsy from a reporter from the newspaper. They still hadn't contacted them, have yet to respond to the medical records request. So it's like they're just completely ignoring the family in this instance. And, you know, it begs the question of why. Even though the medical examiner's report indicate that it was a drowning, an independent review of those results clearly prove that her summary is conflicting with those results and that there's no way he drowned. But you don't have to be an expert to know that there's something wrong. For example, the fact that he was recovered in white briefs, his mother would immediately know. Number one, he didn't wear white underwear. Number two, he didn't own a pair of white briefs. So whose underwear was Mont wearing and why? To this day, the family still doesn't have Lamont's belongings that was supposedly recovered at the scene. They've submitted no less than three requests and these, inf these requests have been ignored. They haven't provided the information to the family whom they claim they want to help. They claim they want to bring closure to yet they won't respond to these requests for information and won't provide their son's clothes to the family. 
Wow, one can't help but wonder. What are the authorities hiding and who are they hiding it for? Why can't the family see the footage showing them that Mont left the Denton County Courthouse willingly? Mm -hmm. Why can't the family have all the records related to his case? Right. Why has the Sheriff's Department sent every single records request made by the family to the state attorney general seeking exemption from having to provide them with public information? Mm -hmm. If authorities are really confident in their own investigation, why wouldn't they want to convince, uh, why would they want to convince the family that they did everything in, in their power to address their concerns related to Mont's death? Yeah, I mean, these are all uh, pretty fair questions. Yeah. You know, I think that any person who lost a family member in the way that Mont was lost yeah. uh, would expect these basic things. Um, and yet, here we are with these questions unanswered. Um, and when I sat down to, to interview Mont's family for this event, one of the, the questions that I asked them was, you know, what it's like living in a community where you've spent your whole life, right? where you've built a life, where you've raised your children, and knowing that You've been and, and to have been let down this way. Yeah. You know, uh, specifically, I asked them if Mont were alive today, knowing that he wanted to work in law enforcement, if Mont were alive today and this had happened to another Denton family, what would he want? Exactly. And what would Mont expect? This is what they told me. It's hard knowing that something happens to someone you truly care about and you don't know what happened to them and there's no way you can find out what happened to them and it seems like no one no one cares about how what happened to him and why he's not here anymore the community could have cared more i feel like two weeks passed they brushed it off you know it's over um they overlooked the whole situation like it wasn't like it wasn't nothing. But I feel like if it was a different kid, you know, it would have been approached differently. They probably would have already had justice. But we are still looking for justice almost three years later. Like Mont would still be fighting. By him wanting to be in law enforcement, he would have wanted law enforcement to do a correct job, a proper job, so that who, who, whoever family is, is going through this situation, that they don't have to suffer. They don't have to uh, call the police department to try to set up interviews, to talk to someone, to find out what's going on. It sums it up, justice, fairness. I think there's a lot of injustice that was done to my family. I think the sheriff's department just chalked it up, and I'm gonna be frank, as a young black kid in Denton County, it's gone. It's gone. So why should we invest our time in taxpayer dollars on notifying this family? Yes. There's a lot of injustice here in Denton County. I buried Lamont in Oklahoma because I was afraid of um, his grave being so how oh. He's afraid of someone uh, doing something to his headstone yeah. or doing something with his grave. Right? Yeah. Yeah. His grave site. Um, at the time, the community um, was so much in an uproar mm -hmm. about what happened. And there was so much, there was threats that was going towards my family. And still, there are still threats going towards my family that we didn't feel safe on burying our son in Denton, mm -hmm. uh, that we took him away from where we are at, where we have to drive 
close to three hours if we just want to go up there and put your hand on his headstone and say, son, we're working on your case or anything. One thing that a lot of people don't know, we have to keep moving every time someone knows where we're at because we can't trust nobody. That's not the way to live. That is not the way to live. Uh, my kids should not have to live in fear uh, when they go to work. My wife should not have to live in fear when she go to the grocery store. I should not have to live in fear uh, here in Denton because I don't believe that the law enforcement, uh, Denton County, it's going to protect my family, and that's not the way that I will live no more. A person shouldn't have to um, live like that in your community uh, here in Denton County where you're afraid something's going to happen and law enforcement is not going to uh, do what they need to do to protect and serve. Um, I actually have a different stance. Uh, about law enforcement now than what I used to have after going through something like this. You know, there's probably a lot of people watching this right now, mm -hmm. really surprised to hear some of the statements just made Absolutely. regarding the reality of families living right here in our Denton community. That said, I'm sure there's some folks watching who aren't that surprised. Right. You know, um, and I want to speak to those of you who are surprised right now and remind you that that is a privilege. Hmm. If Mont's story was shocking to you tonight, if hearing his story seems unfathomable, mm. impossible, that something like this could happen right here in your own community in this day and age. That is a privilege hmm. that you can feel that way. Yeah. Because for many families, not just moms, but for many families, right now in Denton and across the nation, they don't feel safe in their own communities. Their children don't feel safe in their own schools. And, and it's important that if you have the privilege to feel surprised, that you externalize that privilege by taking action. Yeah. And making meaning out of it. And helping to create a world where all of our communities get to feel safe, all of the members in our community get to feel safe. And now's a good time. Obviously, I think we need to talk about our next musical performance, which obviously I'm gonna kick that to you. You're, you're, uh, you got something really special in store for us. Yeah, I wrote a three uh, song lament. Um, lament is something that is so important to me because just as we experience, experience these tragedies, it's important that we express the grief of it and not just go to the next thing, that yeah. we sit in the sorrow that we've lost a young man in our community or, and that we've lost um, so many yeah. from, to injustice. And so the name of the uh, entire piece is called Black Requiem. Um, and I'm not Catholic, but um, rec I am a, a music person. And so a requiem um, is like a mass for the dead. And I named it Black Requiem to honor the many lives lost and just the heinous crimes of injustice against black and brown uh, bodies. And so it's three songs, but combined in one song. And the first song is called Ice Cream, Ice Cream, Stop Killing Me. I initially started writing this song when Botham Jean was murdered in his own home. And it just kind of, over a year or so, hearing Lamont's story, Darius Tarver, Breonna Taylor, George, George Floyd, just all the names, the, the song just kind of grew from there. First part is, I scream, I scream, stop killing me. Second part is a rap uh, from my son. His name is Jamie, but he goes by Mystic. And um, 
it's just an old school flavor, but he's a Gen Zer, and it <laughs> seems like we're singing and saying the same things that were said by my generation and the generations before. So it's kind of reminiscent of like, it, it, to me it's like an MLK, I have a dream speech, but to the tune of this generation. Yeah. Um, and then the third section is called Mary Weep, Martha Moan. In the black community, there's a song called Mary Don't You Weep, Martha Don't You Moan. And um, I just twisted the words, shifted the words to say that we should weep and that we should moan and we should grieve and we should cry out in sorrow and we should allow people the space to be sad about this horrifically sad thing. And so I have a band of uh, a collective of artists who joined me to bring the song to life. And um, that's it. Just, I'm really, uh, I'll be speaking the names of many uh, names that we've heard over the past few years. Um, and uh, it's one that, it's a song that's really dear to my heart as we, as I'm, as I'm trying to give creative uh, justice through music and art. So. And as, a, as we've made perfectly clear, tonight is a, a three-part mission, right? It's part, um, you know, Requiem, it's part memorial and, and remembrance. Yes. Uh, but it's also um, part outreach, Yes. right? And, and getting information out. And it's also, of course, as we've, I'm sure, made abundantly clear, part fundraiser. Yeah. Um, and before we uh, go to your performance, I just want to let everyone know that we are just $2,000 away, just shy of $2,000 from reaching our goal of raising $10,000 tonight towards the independent investigative fund uh, for Lermont Stowers Jones's family. Uh, I just want to encourage everyone to go right now. If you're watching on uh, social media platforms, please visit justicevermont.com where you can make a contribution directly, uh, leave messages of encouragement for the family. Uh, you can buy a t-shirt, uh, yes. which will help memorialize Mont, yes. spread his story, but also raise money. And of course, last but not least, um, you can bid on artwork in our online art auction. We have uh, more than three dozen works of art generously donated by uh, Denton Creatives. And all of these things go towards our goal. Um, but uh, without further ado, don't let me uh, prolong it anymore. Um, let's see this uh, wonderful performance, this moving performance from KB Uncomplicated featuring Katina Stone Butler and your son, Mystic. Thank you. Somebody tell me why such a 
work them paper cats to go. Hey, Mama Ben ain't never coming home, no. Mary we can't walk them all. Oh, hey, Mama Ben ain't never coming home, no, Mary no, 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 no. When our people ain't coming home, no. When our people ain't hey, coming home. Oh, hey, got the license out the club box, no. Baby Mama Ben. Who ain't here? My sisters who ain't here. Jesus, 
my tears pour out on the ground. Whoa. Our babies ain't coming home. Mary, we mock them all when our people ain't coming home. So, uh, first of all, that was beautiful, Thank you. and I'm really proud of you and your family for just putting together such an epic um, performance um, and for debuting that performance and that work as part of this. I know it means a lot uh, to the Jones family, and uh, I personally just find it really empowering to see so many people um, coming together yeah. in solidarity and love for the Jones family. And I just want to encourage everyone out there one last time, uh, if you haven't yet, uh, visit justicevermont.com, share the website. Uh, the family's website is going to be your home base to get updates about Mont's case and his story. We promise to make sure uh, that that information is constantly updated. Uh, our goal tonight was to raise $10,000 by the end of our event. We have come just shy of that. Um, we, we are just about $1,700 short of that goal. So please, uh, this, and that's just our goal for tonight, right? right. And, and the, the funds will be continued, uh, the efforts and, and work will continue. Uh, so continue to stay involved, pay attention to the site, spread Mont's story. Uh, you can make contributions directly. Our, our online art auction is closed, uh, but we will open that back up. I, I understand there's a still a few items that didn't sell, um, but not very many. So right. I'm really glad to see that be so successful. Um, but I just want to make sure that everyone understands that uh, the work continues as uh, Mont's uh, aunt pointed out earlier, Angela James, she said that the family has a fight on their hands, but the difference is now yeah. they're not fighting alone. Right. That's you right. Know, that's we're fighting right. together. And that's why we want to thank everyone who has donated, purchased art and T-shirts, and helped produce and promote this event over the last few months. Just everyone. There's, such, there's been such an outpouring of love and generosity and support people giving their time, their talent, and their treasure to support this family. We're gonna continue this work, um, and we are going to see, this family is going to see justice for their son, uh, for their brother, for their nephew. They're going to see justice for Lamont. And thank you, thank you, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to invest, even in this moment, to hear his story as told by his family. Um, not according to the news, but according to his family, because that's important. And so we hope that this spurs you on. You can continue to donate, um, follow, uh, subscribe, keep an eye on the website to, con uh, to see progress, uh, because we're gonna continue this work. And Jessica, I wanna thank you for putting this together uh. and just for standing with the family um, and drawing out all the facts and pulling out, like really being the investigator of this case. Like, yeah. Not being anymore. The real, now, the we real have, investigator. now we have professional investigators hired with the support yes. of, of the community making contributions. Um, uh, some footwork was done, but I, I definitely um, have handed it over to people far more qualified yeah. than me now. Yeah. But um, 
with the help of so many. So thank you Absolutely. to everyone who has donated and continues to contribute and uh, support the work that we're doing. That said, uh, we're gonna close our broadcast tonight with a message directly from the family of Lermont Stowers Jones. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanna know what happened, pretty much. Um, I just, well, let me change that. I need to know what happened for my soul, for my family's soul. I need to know what happened. Um, it's not easy. Um, it's not easy when you don't have answers. I feel terrible sometimes. When we go up to his grave, we don't have answers for who put him there, why he's there. It's horrible. You can't, I can't. I don't, I don't know why he's there. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely. Who put him there? Yeah, he definitely did not deserve it. And I don't think no kid deserve it. Uh, deserves that. I don't think no family deserves not having answers. The hardest thing is parents or even my brothers to, or brother or sister is not knowing. Right. Not knowing is the hardest thing. You can't have closure if you don't know uh, what happened. And that's one of the hardest things that I have learned uh, to try to deal with is not knowing. Well, I want everybody to know Lamont wasn't a troublemaker. And I want to find out what happened to my son. He's gone three years now, and nobody can tell me what happened. Nobody can tell me why he was where he was. Nobody can tell me how he ended up in the water. Can nobody tell me what happened? I'm still wondering what happened to Lamont Stout Jones. What I want the community of Denton to know is that the family hopes that they stand with us in this fight to justice, in this fight to truth, that a lot of people across the city and county where Lerman works have approached him and indicated they suspect something was wrong. They suspect that story that they were told was not the truth and that there's something else there. The family doesn't deserve this. They've given their lives to this community. They've spent the majority of Lamont's life in this community and he doesn't, does not deserve or did not deserve the ending that he received. Um, he was a vibrant young man with a vibrant future and it was ripped from him and lies told, lies covered up. And um, we need to get to truth. We need to get to justice. As though Lamont were your son. Assume Lamont was your son, what would you want? What would you believe? What would you do? What would you expect? And that's, that's what we want you to consider when you think about helping this family, when you think about supporting this family in any way that you can, as though Lamont were your child and he came up missing in a body of water that you knew he wouldn't jump into.
Thank you.